Welcome, everybody. I was thinking as I was writing out my introductory remarks. So this is so silly because I'm about to read this to you, and yet, as my art history students will say, I hardly ever look at my notes when I'm right. Right. But tonight, I want to make sure I get it right. So, <laughs> so bear with me. I can put my glasses on. Um, I'm Pam Bramble. I'm the uh, coordinating director of the Arts Project here at uh, UConn, and uh, we are very pleased to have Richard uh, Hayes here tonight to talk about. Uh, his beautiful work that you see displayed behind you. And uh, our exhibit called What's In There, uh, Exploring the Beauty and Energy Within Trees Through Woodworking, uh, also is found in our, with our brick wall space. And there are a series of several black and white photographs that Richard took, I'm quite sure when they were, when Bell was made. Uh, when was that? Late last year or early? It was early this year. Early this year, yes. So when we were talking about putting an exhibit together, uh, one of the main tenets of the arts project is the creative process. How does an artist work from the initial concept to the final piece? What, what happens? And so all of our exhibits that, the exhibits that I curate um, need to have that as a central part of what we end up showing our audience. So for, for Richard, we did kind of a reversal. Uh, normally, when we have two-dimensional artists, painters, photographers, uh, printmakers, the, the, the main thrust of the show is on the brick wall space. And then in our Whitson Gallery cabinets, we have source material, sketchbooks, incomplete work, things like that that kind of give us a feel for the finished pieces. For Richard, we, we reversed it um, for obvious reasons. Uh, so I think there's 30, or 35 individual pieces on display here, and then the black and white <coughs> photographs that chronicle the development of Bell, which is found in the corner. Uh, so, I just add with all that well, and we'll move on. <laughs> uh, I would like to share a few uh, bio uh, biographical notes on Richard Hayes by way of introduction. Looking at his accomplished work on exhibits, it may be surprising to learn that Richard did not pursue art in college nor did he dedicate himself to the making of art until the early 1990s. But rather, he pursued uh, his, uh, his strong interest in science. He grew up in Ohio and earned his PhD in organic chemistry from Stanford University. And his career as a chemist and pharmaceutical researcher was very productive. Uh, he worked in both Kansas City and in the Philadelphia area. And during his tenure, he was a published author uh, between his own uh, publications and co-authorship, uh, close to 90 publications. And he also holds patents, and he is the author of a rather comprehensive text in his field of specialization. Richard has always been interested in science and in the natural world. He chose science as his vocation, making furniture and art as his application. And his love of nature is that bridge. On the subject of wood's uniqueness, he says, quote, a tree's tissue, the wood, contains a detailed record of its life, written overtly in patterns of grain, color, and density, and covertly in the stresses that are revealed only as the wood changes shape in season, quote. In the early 1990s, Richard became particularly interested in one woodworking tool, and that is the lathe because it allowed him to utilize big chunks of wood that came directly from trees, as opposed to wood that you would get at the lumber yard where that, that, the treeness of that piece of wood was already uh, well into its past. And as he says, it is the trees, the energy and the individuality of them that he finds inspiring. So how to unlock that energy and beauty? It seems that for him, the precision and technical potential of the lathe is uniquely suited for this task of revealing what lies within. Richard learned woodworking by reading books and practicing on the lathe, making bowls and vases, lidded vessels from firewood and salvage logs. He joined the American Association of Woodworker, Woodturners and has learned much about his craft by attending local and regional meetings and national symposia, observing demonstrations by professionals, and in general, as he says, benefiting greatly from interactions with other turners who are generous in sharing their knowledge and skills. In 2005, he retired from his full-time work in chemistry 
to devote himself more seriously to the craft of working with wood by lathe and by carving. The same year, he and his wife Anna moved to Litchfield to be nearer to her New England roots. Finally, in talking about his creative process, Richard states that, quote, I use what I can read of that history as cues to guide my design, which may be that of a utilitarian vessel or an aesthetic object. I combine the inspiration I receive from the character of each piece of wood with images of line and form and proportion taken from nature or from artists in a variety of media. My goal is to use the lathe and the chisel to make objects that allow the wood to speak its history and at the same time to be beautiful interesting and intriguing. His craft, his sense of exploration, and his realization of his artistic ideas are beautiful. They are interesting. They are intriguing. And they are an affirmation of what dedication and a singular vision can achieve. His work in this exhibit, What's in There? Exploring the beauty and energy within trees through woodworking, shows us what he has found. I now introduce Richard Hayes. That's a wonderful introduction. I think she's pretty much covered my subject. <laughs> um, but I would like to thank Pam and the others involved with the arts project uh, for the opportunity to make a display like this and to talk to you about uh, something I'm really excited about. Um, it's, been a, it's been a really interesting opportunity for me because uh, in, in thinking about how to set up a display like this, and in especially in thinking about what to speak about, it, it's caused me to think an awful lot about, you know, why, why do I like you know, this? And, and what, what gets me excited? And uh, that sort of stuff. And, and who knows, maybe there will be some insight to this <laughs> that will be good for me in, in the future. Anyway, um, I have a feeling that, that, that using the lathe to do craft or art, however you want to define that, is, is a fairly new phenomenon and, and not as well known to most people as, say, using paintbrushes or potter's wheels. <coughs> so I thought I'd start at an elementary level uh, and start with the machine. Okay, uh, This is a typical modern lathe, and in common with all of them, and there are many, kinds available on the market. It has sort of four components in common with everything. And, and the first is this very strong base uh, split into two ways. And it's, it's rigid and it resists vibration of the spinning wood. The second is called the headstock. And it, it's the part that delivers power for the rotation of wood uh, through a, a horizontal spindle that will rotate the wood on a horizontal axis. And in this picture, you see one of the devices, one of the various kinds that can be used to attach a piece of wood to the lathe. It just screws on. Uh, the other part is a tailstock, which can optionally be used to stabilize the opposite end of a piece of wood as it spins. Imagine a table leg. You always have to have that to hold things together. Uh, but if you're making a bowl, then most steps you can do without it can be moved away or locked tightly into position. And then the last component is this assembly that holds the uh, tool rest. And uh, it can move in all directions up and down. And there's a variety of tool rests that can be inserted. Um, and uh, this basically does as it suggests it holds the tool. Uh, but all of this together does nothing but make wood spin around. Nothing else happens without an operator. And the magic begins when the wood turner takes the tool in his hand and stabilizes it on the rest and holds it against the wood uh, to cut the wood away, whatever isn't a bowl ends up on the floor. Uh, so that's sort of what the lathe is. Um, and I, I want to, this may sound pedantic or something, but. I think it's worth talking about this a little bit because through most of the lathe's history, the word craft really means 
occupation, trade, um, or a job, and it has little or nothing to do with artistic endeavor or aspiration. Um, Lathes go way back, a couple thousand years probably, and as crude as they, they were, uh, some people evidently could make quite nice objects with them, um, especially if you work for a Kaiser, you were probably pretty skilled. Uh, and, uh, but this is a utilitarian object in the end. Um, by this 18th century approximately, most wood uh, turning lathes would have been in a shop environment um, where they might have been joined by other machines or additional lathes, depending on whether it's a furniture making shop or something else. And these would have been centrally powered through a long axle here that was driven by a water mill, say, like other kinds of mills. And then the individual machines would have been powered by belt takeoffs like this. And into the 19th century and so on, these could have been quite large shops, factories, in fact, uh, behaving the same way people doing their jobs on the way, making utilitarian items bowls or table mates or furniture, furniture parts and things like that. Um, by the late 19th century, the central power might have been provided by an electric motor instead of a water wheel. And then it wasn't until the second decade of the 20th century that freestanding ways began to be manufactured with their own motors. And, and this sort of development corresponded with the decline in the apprenticeship system by which turners uh, would learn the trade uh, from others and uh, the expansion of universal education. So schools began acquiring ways and teaching industrial arts courses to familiarize students with manual jobs that they might be interested in pursuing in the future. Again, still, this is all practical work concern very little with aesthetics or, or art. Um, that's, that would have been me in 1964. <laughs> I took industrial art. Um, James Prestini is one of the first two or three, earliest two or three people who are mentioned in the history of wood turning, wood turning as a modern craft, uh, to, have, to have had his own shop and had, had sort of an aesthetic aspiration to explore the artistic potential of the objects he was making. They're still utilitarian. Uh, but uh, he's trying to be artistic. And this is sort of a, a new thing. You know, uh, wood turning had no tradition of artisanship or, or, or artistic efforts. Um, but James, uh, along with a few others who were doing this kind of work in the second quarter of the 20th century, were all by themselves you know, in their own workshops scattered around the country. And it wasn't until 1976 that the first wood turning symposium was held, in which about 20 wood turners of his caliber, I guess, uh, were gathered together in one place to talk to each other and to show each other techniques and talk about you know, their designs and their ideas about uh, how to do neat stuff with, with wood that might not be necessarily utilitarian. Uh, 1976. Uh, it was a decade after that before uh, there was anywhere anyone could go to learn wood cutting uh, as in a class taught by a professional or a teacher. Uh, and it was in 1986 that that the American Association of Wood Turners was founded, um, which provided a, an additional mechanism of exchange between people who were interested in this activity. So, you know, what was that, 30 years ago? It hasn't been that long at all since wood turning has been, could have been, I guess, considered to be a, a field within the craft. And such 
has been the progress since then that, oh, I don't know, there must be 12 or 14,000 members of the American Association of Lutherans. Uh, there are frequent uh, museum exhibits of Lutheran objects. There was one last summer in the uh, Museums acquire turn wood pieces now with some frequency. Um, so things have really taken off, and it's been very exciting. Of course, I knew nothing of this when I started. Um, what's next? So what, did, what attracted me first? I have little triggers here, so I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, I, I started out an interest in wood, woodworking um, as an avocation, and among the more ambitious projects was two or three pieces of furniture for the house. And I liked that, you could buy boards and so on. Um, but during the construction of this piece, I, I managed to buy a lathe very cheaply along with some tools at an auction. And so I thought, this is fun. And so I designed, oops, I designed, a, you can't see them, bun feet for this. So I'd have an excuse to use the lathe <laughs> uh, in my furniture. Uh, and, and after that, it was all over. <laughs> flat boards are just boring. And um, the other thing about flat boards, especially if you're picking out cherry for a furniture piece, you don't want any knots or defects or anything else. But what happens to the other two-thirds of the cherry tree? Um, I, I liked what, what the wood looked like near, near a, a knot or in some area of crazy grain. It was more interesting. Um, and so this sort of thinking kind of intersected with my frugal upbringing uh, to lead me to pay attention to places along the road where the utility companies would cut down trees and leave the logs. And then after that, the firewood scavengers would come to pick up all the wood they could split. And, and what they left behind was the neatest stuff. It had all the crazy grain in it all the branches and detail. So I started picking this kind of stuff up and playing with it on the lathe. And that's how I kind of got my love of uh, exploring wood and, and thinking about in the log and laying around what's in there that can be interesting that I can reveal. Uh, what turns me on now? Well, uh, uh, Pam already told you about this. Like most other people who try to create things, I try to pay attention to the objects around me and, and remember when something attracts my attention. Why do I like that? Why do I like that curve? Why do I like that form, that line, that shape? And although I don't almost never really try to copy an object like that when I make something, I think the sort of memory of those lines or whatever it is merges with others in my brain and gets in there somehow. And when I'm then working on the lathe to design something, it maybe oozes out again or something like that, <laughs> unconsciously. So that's where I get some of my inspiration. But I do love trees. I really, I love walking in the forest. And I love, I really love standing live trees. And honestly, I don't look at them very often being potential stacks of bowls. <laughs> but, you know, I don't cut down trees to make, to get wood from my bowls. There's plenty of wood that's knocked down by uh, storms or cut down by people for their own purposes. Uh, so that there's no shortage of wood, local wood, for me to play with. And I, never, I never go now. Um, I, Trees are so amazing. I could go on for a long time about this, but I don't want to. Um, trees are among the largest living things on Earth. The oldest living things on Earth are trees. And um, trees, I think, uniquely among all living objects. You, know, you can think of tortoise shells and sea creature shells. Keep a record of their growth inside. And that's what fascinates me about this. I can, you know, when I, when I think about a tree or look at a log going down, I can 
sort of get into its its growth somehow mentally. You know, I guess that's that's something to try. Even even old trees. This is this is one along Whitewoods Road in Morris near Windy, and, and it, it's been dying for years. And every time I drive by, I notice. It. And it's even got kind of a grandeur. Ah, my next trip. <laughs> this reminds me to pass around some of these. These are slices of waste pieces of wood that I have chainsawed off in, in getting a, a piece that I want to turn. And sometimes when they look interesting, I, I save them. Or I slice off the piece and sand and finish one side and uh, just stick them around. But, but I, I'll, I'll invite you to look closely at these and just sort of get into and, and look at the patterns and colors and texture. Well, not so much texture. The patterns and colors. Um, because that's kind of what I what I do here. This is just a from a log again beside the road. And um, to me, this this it, it, it's interesting to look at this and, and say, okay, they were two <coughs> separate stems, two separate trees, or two separate stems of one tree. And after so many years, this one went so many years, and this went so many years, and then eventually they grew so close together they had to squish each other and, and then they trapped some bark in between. And then the, and then the new tissues sort of struggled to find out uh, which tree they belonged to and then eventually they became one tree at this level. And that tells the story to me. And if, if you go farther up in the tree, you can search out and learn when the next branch first budded off. You can imagine uh, as the new layers of tissue grew every year on that space between the branch and the, and the main stem, uh, all the layers of tissue struggling to figure out you know, which way they were going to go, and that results in these layers of crotch figure, very desired fancy kind of woods, and, which you see in a couple of the samples. And that's an important too. Uh, but it's this story of the tree. Um, the tree's life that sort of gets me going. Um, okay. So these pieces, for example, are from an old, uh, from a, a, a fairly old for its size, uh, white ash that was growing in, in one of my property. In the, it was growing under cover of other trees and, and not doing very well. It's evidence of narrow growth things. And it died and fell over. And when I cut it for firewood, I, I noticed that it had been sustained an injury at some time in its life. And, and I found this fascinating because I can figure out how old the tree was when it got bumped. And I can look at each successive layer of growth rings every year and, and see how many years it took that tree to repair that wound and to bury it uh, to, to the point where it was <coughs> invisible. And to me, you know, somehow revealing that, that history was interesting, an interesting thing to do. I think I reversed the buttons on this one. Uh, likewise, when a tree gets old, it begins to rot. So what happens? Uh, fungi invade the, 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 the tissues and begin ca causing discolorations, sometimes strikingly clear um, zone lines. Um, and uh, again, that's another kind of beauty that you can find in wood, as well as the ripples in grain as it was growing. Even, a, even a, a stem of a, an old uh, shrub from the yard with a branch in it uh, can, can be interesting. Uh, and of course, there's plain old straight grain, too. And when I make an object, 
even though it might be utilitarian, like a salad bowl. What I'm trying to do is, is to help the, help the viewer to kind of look at the wood closely and think about the texture of the wood and things like that. So that's sort of the background. Um, I have three examples uh, of sequences of photos showing how I actually go about making things. Uh, this is more technical, less philosophical. Please ask any questions. I forgot to invite this at the beginning, if you'd like to. You were introduced as both a wood turner and a wood maker. I think those are the two things. What's the difference? Oh, I don't know. I think lots of terms can be used interchangeably. Okay. A wood turner usually refers to someone who, who works on the lathe. One could be called a, a wood carver to uh, either because he uses regular chisels by hand or even wood chisels on the right. Uh, one could be called a bowl maker too. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think the specifics of the name. Spalded maple. Do you harden it first, or do you turn it fresh? Or I, I don't harden it. Don't um, harden. Sometimes in desperation, in the final stages, when I'm having, you, so you're it becomes too difficult to get it fresh. Some, some sort of, yeah. How do you harden? One can use uh, adhesives. Uh, super glue is a popular way to do it, or uh, for larger areas. I'm familiar with using two-part epoxy. Mm -hmm. I used to, they got a, when I was, when I was working on wood 50 years ago, uh, we used two-part epoxy and soaked it. Now they've got a, 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 a one, it's like a urethane hardener that you soak it in. Mm -hmm. And then wax makes one and somebody else makes one. And, yeah. And it, it really solidifies. I showed you, which had um, more decay towards the bottom, I kind of avoided the, the worst of the rock and just picked the intermediate blooms, which have changed color but not yet lost their integrity. And it's always mm -hmm. the, balance. the transition is usually the prettiest, but yeah. sometimes you hit that rotted wood and it's beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Thanks to the wonders of chemistry. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Richard, what does spalted mean? Spalted is a term to refer to the. Uh, I don't know how precise I can be, but but it refers to the, the, the what happens to wood when it begins to be decayed, mm -hmm. and it's typically uh, an invasion of fungi, which mm -hmm. start the process. Mm -hmm. And the spalting, I, I don't know, I see it referred to as, as the appearance of the surface of wood or the interior of wood, or the process that happens when wood starts to undergo this. So it's, it, it's evidenced by this colored pattern mm -hmm. that I think will, will I'll, I'll point a couple out. Okay. Are there certain word, uh, certain woods that you're more fond of using than others, but that are easier to work with? Or well, uh, I guess the, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> uh, that's terrible. Uh, I, I would have said earlier, cherry is my favorite word because it works beautifully. It's it, it's very nice to it behaves nicely, and it's a pretty wood. It gets prettier with age. Uh, but I've had so many interesting discoveries with plain old sugar maple lately that uh, you know, I'm a 
excited about that now as much as anything. And I hope to be excited about other ones in the future. Right. So I'm kind of Catholic right now. So <laughs> Uh, how does one make things? Well, uh, preliminaries. They start with logs. They don't cut down trees. This, uh, these logs were a gift of Bruce and, and Sue Frisch in this room. <laughs> a tree that had fallen down on her property. Um, but uh, one cannot uh, <coughs> let logs lay around too long because they start cracking and that damages the wood and makes it more difficult to re reduces the amount of wood that can be used productively in the nice piece. Uh, so one practical solution to that, if one has a big pile of logs, like I showed you in the last slide, is to do what's called roughing out of pieces. You can fairly rapidly go through and, and make preliminary versions of bowls and things like that, and then seal them with a wax-based sealer, and then put them on the shelf to season slowly, and with luck they won't crack, and you can go back any time in the future completely. Um, likewise, you can do the same thing by making billets, uh, or even rectangles of wood, and cook them, uh, which is, any of which is better than trying to keep your logs around. So a specific example, uh, I'm going to describe the making of the bell, which is in the corner, covered back there. And this is a case where I, I started with this piece of American beech uh, from a branch section. And uh, I'm aware that beech uh, changes shape a lot in the seasons. For that reason, it's not often practical for lumber and things like that. Um, but that's an advantage if you want to try to make a piece in which the wood will express its own will as part of the process. So I, I, I looked at this and tried to imagine what was in, in there and imagine how I could what I could make out of there that would show the character I was seeing in there. Sort of like trying to use a mental MRI or CAT scan machine and say, okay, what does that look like? Well, what I, what I thought I would, would like to do is make a sort of a conical object uh, with the narrow part up here truncated on the bottom and the wider part down there and angle it like this so it would include all of this crazy grain that's going to be inside and maybe bark inclusions as part of the deal. And so the first thing I did was to cut off the, the bottom of that at, a, at an angle. Uh, and uh, oriented myself more here and used the chainsaw to further remove pieces that I didn't want to be there, and I got it down to the point where I could mount it on the lathe. So it's held at the headstock here and the tailstock there. And from then on, it's a matter of taking away wood that doesn't belong there anymore. Richard, how heavy was that when you put it on the lathe, would you say? I don't know. Uh, the original log was on the order of 100 pounds or 110 pounds. The bell weighs 12 ounces. <laughs> so uh, you can see the, the wild grain in here, and down in here is going to be other stuff. And uh, by this time, I have decided it's going to, the form is going to be a bell. So back here, I'm still uh, not sure what it's going to be, and I'm sort of looking at how much I need to take off to get rid of the bark things like that, but by now it's going to be a bell. And so then I prepare this end uh, to be grabbed by a chuck on the headstock end, and so I can flip it around, and I've securely fastened it on this end, and I'm stabilizing it on that end, and that allows me to work on 
refining the surface uh, shape and to begin hollowing. And in the first stages of hollowing, I, I retained the tail stock in here because the weight of this was, was too heavy. But after the point at which a lot of wood was taken away, it got light enough, I could remove the tail stock, uh, cut out this little guy, and then finish the hollowing process. And this is the final piece directly off the lathe. It's totally super completely round uh, and symmetrical. Uh, but it's got this great, beautiful defect in there. <laughs> and all this crazy green over there. And on the sides you can't see, there are two or three uh, knots where the side branches have come out. And I know this is going to change shape. Um, but I, I've made a great effort to make the walls thin enough so that when it changes shape it doesn't crack, it just bends. And in this case I was lucky. And uh, after drying for several weeks and then I completed the sanding of the surface and then lacquered it, this is what it looks like. So to me that's more fun than a round belt because I've done what I could to make form and the nice thin walls and everything else. But then I would let the wood say, okay, I want to do this too. Um, and that to me is part of the fun. Uh, a completely Richard, another how old how old was that piece of wood you were working with? And you know, between the time you had it cut and the time you evolved this bell, created this bell. Is there a year that goes by? Or? No, no, this was, <coughs> I harvested this in late winter. A winter storm knocked it down on, on the property of somebody else in Litchfield. And so I cut it up, and I brought it home, and I coated the ends of the cut log with this wax emulsion to slow down cracking. And it was probably two or three months before I picked it up and started working. And once I, once I started with the chainsaw and then put it on the lathe, it was maybe two or three days before it was the turning was finished. Right. So the cracking is caused by the drying of the wood? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. When wood dries, it, it shrinks more in the radial direction than in the longitudinal direction. In other words, if you think of it, tree or a log is being a, a bunch of straws mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, packed together, then as it dries and the cells uh, break down and lose water, the straws get narrower, but they don't get shorter this way. Right? And so that's what causes logs to crack from the outside in, because all of the, all of the, ra all of the, the radial dimensions are getting smaller and it has no choice but to crack and pull apart as it does Got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. and, and you say the wax slows it down, but is the wax porous to allow a little bit of air to get in there? Oh, yeah, it's not perfect. Ah, okay. I mean, you can take a log that would normally crack in, let's say, a month, and, and with the wax coating, it might last that long without cracking. It won't go forever. Uh, it just slows things down. Gives you more. One more example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is a hollow form, which is also on display over there. Um, I don't have a beginning shot, but this is this is this is a piece of sugar maple uh, from a very old tree that was rotted. In the and again, there's this. There's, there's partly very good, nice, pure, white, creamy wood on the outside, and then there's this intermediate zone, and then cut off is the totally rotted part. Uh, but I retained some of this intermediate stuff, and the gentleman here will notice that this is this is punky wood. This is starting to lose its integrity, uh, but there's still beautiful parts. And so I put this on with the intention of making a spherical, 
a hollow form based on the sphere, not necessarily, but spherical. So I removed most of the wood, and I can see more and more what I'm getting at here. A good third of it has this nice color, and the rest has some nice ripply grain figure. Uh, and so at this point, when I've got a sort of a round object, I, I made the decision that down here is going to be the top, which I'll hollow from, and down there is going to be the base. So I flip it 90 degrees, and I shape it so that I can provide a, a tenon on one end that will be grabbed by the, the headstock of the lathe when I'm ready, and a top which I'll hollow in from. And so then I've flipped it around, and I'm holding it here, and I'm not using a tailstock, and I'm hollowing through this direction. see residues of the residual ripply grain that are intersecting with some crazy colors. I don't have a final shot there, but you can go look at it. I'll show you one more, but I'll go through it quickly. Uh, pear box is a totally different animal. I know what the form is going to be like from the beginning. This is a seasoned piece of wood. Nothing's going to change. To make a lidded box, you want wood that's totally seasoned. It's not going to move anymore because the bottom and the top will stop fitting together. It goes on the lathe, gets rounded, gets trimmed on the ends so that one end can be grabbed tightly here. And the form is begun. And the decision is made where the top and bottom are going to meet. And then the top is taken away. And the hollowing of the bottom begins, continues, and is completed. The formation of a little rim with a little ridge inside. And the bottom is, this is refined a little bit. Here and then it's taken away, and the top is put on the headstock, and then the top is hollowed out, and a complementary ridge to meet the bottom part is made here uh, with adjustments, trying it out, tuning it out, trying it out, tuning it out, and then the two pieces are put back together, held gently with the tailstock, so that then the whole surface can be refined, and especially a division between the top and bottom can be smoothed over. Uh, the bottom, the excess wood on the bottom can be taken away, leaving a little nib here, which will be carved away by hand. And this little, what is that called? This is the thingamajig at the bottom of the fruit. It still has, the, you know, that's what that is. Uh, and then the top gets refined and prepared for the sort of negative curve in there and the stem and voila. And after finishing it looks like that and because of the narrow cut I've taken between the top and the bottom, the grain is almost match. How do you control the yeah, I mean, so if this is the same dimensions as your bottom dimension when you're doing them separately. Well, you may have noticed that I made the bottom first. I hollowed yeah. out first and made the little rim ridge on the bottom. Mm -hmm. And I adjusted that to an approximate, what I thought would be approximately the right dimensions. Well, how do you adjust whatever it is on the lathe to ah. get something that matches? Well, I have no idea. Okay. You look like you're doing it all mysteriously. Okay. 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 He just wriggles I, his nose. I'm, I'm <laughs> continually moving that tool rest around and moving it around mm -hmm. so that it is in the right position so I can hold the tool just so to take little cuts or bigger cuts depending in just the direction I want. But I'm 
mean, or all those directions. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm used to doing things with a ruler or a whatever. Oh, I, I, use, you, I use rulers. <laughs> you, know, you, you, use, you whip one out and measure and then go I back. Use calipers. Calipers. I use calipers. Calipers. Yeah. Okay. But when making a fit like this, okay. you know, you just make one end. Yeah. And then while you're making the other end, you get it closed and then just try to put them together. And you take a tiny bit more off and put them together okay. and it doesn't quite go yet. You take a tiny bit. And it's a trial and error. Okay. Over and over again. And you're very careful to do it slowly because if you take too much of it off, yeah, I know. then it's a floppy I fit realize. and you can't recover from that. Okay. So, wood turners try for the perfect fit. Yeah, I think it is. It goes. I can't make the noise, but you know, it's not quite a thud. But it's a little resistance, but not too much. It's impossible. Is the inside as smooth and finished as the outside? No. <laughs> Wouldn't I like to do that? But it's very hard. Uh, for something like this, but you don't, you're not reaching and you can see, and I, I try my best to make a smooth interior using various scraper tools. Get the worst of the ridges out. So if it's a if it's a bowl you can actually see into, then the rule says you have to uh, make that nice. And if it's a hollow bowl, a real small bowl, but you can't even see in, eh. <laughs> <laughs> you want it thin so that the piece is not heavy like the rock. It's more elegant. It's thin, it's light, but what it looks like. That is the end of my exposition. Does anyone have any other questions? Richard, how do you decide how thick to make the walls? That's a personal preference and a, and a, and a skill issue. There are wood turners who glory in making ultra thin things. And they can be elegant and beautiful. But they're, they're hard to do. But in your case, some of the thinner ones, you're making thinner so that it will go <coughs> through its distortions as it dries. Yeah. yeah. But like this, you've got to keep relatively thick so it remains dimensionally stable? No. No. This is seasoned wood, so I can make it really thin and it will stay that way. I mean, any wood will change a little bit according to humidity. Right. Uh, but uh, thickness is not needed for something like this for, for the fit to remain. Unless you get it so thin that it just doesn't you know, support itself. But you know, I, I still adhere to the school that the thin is in, uh, and thin is more cool than thick. So that's a that's a preference. This gentleman here asked if the inside was as smooth. When I worked in the cabinet shop, I worked with an old French Canadian wood turner, and I was the only one who could work with him because I was patient enough to understand his accent. And what he would do when he was doing something like this, he would put in maybe a cup of sand and turn the lathe on and walk away. <laughs> and it would smooth out the inside. Then he'd dump that coarse sand out, put a finer sand in turn it on and walk away. And so it may not have been as smooth and beautiful as here, but when he was doing a bowl, I mean a, a base or something like that, that's how he would smooth the inside. That's like rock, uh, yeah, rock tumbling? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How long does it take? Oh, he, he never told me that. He <laughs> had to keep some secrets. Hopefully not a week. <laughs> yeah, it's slowing you down. Okay. Yeah. But that's how he would smooth the inside. Yeah, and then he would. I, I can see the wheels turning. <laughs> Richard is going to run home and try it right out. <laughs> but he sharp, had sharp sand. You know? He had a coarse sand to begin with, yeah. uh, just like you're doing with sandpaper. You know, it was a coarse yeah. sandpaper mm -hmm. and go down to your tool. So he always said he never used, he never got it as smooth inside. But yeah. Then he would throw the tongue oil in. And it for a while too. Right. Interesting. He only used fun well. Yeah. Purist. <laughs> I wish he had, I wish I'd worked with him longer so I would have gotten to Sounds like be a 
Turner, but I would, it was a fascinating old man. Sounds like it. Great opportunity. Jerry? Yeah, speaking of finishing off the wood, how often do you sharpen your tools? Oh, frequently. 15 minutes, 10 minutes. Oh, oh man. Man. That uh, It's important, I think, for most wood turners to have a, a, a grinder set up. And uh, like most, I use uh, jigs, uh, which uh, allow me to very quickly regrind a tool, keeping exactly the same angle on the, on the gouge. And it's especially important for gouges, whole gouges, and compound curves on your, on your cutting edges. Uh, but it only takes 30 seconds. Put it in the jig. Else? How, how do you get the color that you want? Uh, do you ever put a stain on it, or you, you let it come out itself? It's, it's the wood. But there is some some coating that you put on there just to preserve it. Yeah. yeah. And that can help bring out the color, too. Yeah, can it? yeah. Now, I know that oil finishes, tongue oil, I use a tongue oil proprietary formula and <coughs> other stuff, too will tend to make colors richer and white woods yellow. So if I want something to pop out white, I'll lacquer instead. Um, but all the, I, I never used color things. I want the wood to sort of show, show as it is. Is it time for goodies to eat? <laughs> well, and also, I think it's also time for people get to see the beautiful work down there. But I have, I have two questions for him, one of which I'm sure a lot of people are thinking of. Uh, the first is, what do you do with all the sawdust? Does the sawdust go to a horse farm? Well, I mean, if you're talking about something that was 12 pounds or 200 pounds or whatever, and then the end result is a few ounces. Uh, and my second question is, is your work for sale? My work is for sale. <laughs> Thank you for asking that. With a plant. I was going to make a joke that I, I brought a truckload with 30 bags of sawdust. And I asked each one of to take one home. Throw it I don't have a good solution, but I've got a huge pile out there mm -hmm. uh, near my shop. And it gets bigger every year. And I've been told that horse farms might be interested in having wood shaving. But I haven't yet gotten around to seeking one out. But I can generate easily a, a garbage can in an afternoon. I'll contact my friend at the ag school, see what we can, mm -hmm. what we can do. Yeah. Um, Especially if you pick it up. Right? Yeah, right, right. <laughs> uh, thank you very much.